Welcome to the Stan State Educast, a podcast created to give our campus experts a platform to share their expertise on various topics and issues. I'm your host, Frankie Tovar, and on this episode, we'll be diving into the world of political science with three guests who are more than qualified to provide both insight and context when it comes to complex political issues. And to call our topic for this episode complex might be an understatement because we will be discussing the January 6th United States Capitol attack, an event that has both been celebrated and denounced and is currently being investigated by the January 6th committee. So without further ado, our guests for this episode, Dr. Stephen Ruth, Dr. Andrew Conte, and Mr. Richard Randall. You're listening to the Stan State Educast, produced on the campus of Stanislaus State. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Frankie. This is great. Thank you. For our listeners out there who might not be familiar with you, uh, an introduction might be in hand. So let's start with some short introductions, and I'll start with Mr. Randall. It's nice to be here. I not only have taught at Stanislaus since 2011, but I was a student at Cal State Stanislaus from 1979 to 1982. So the campus is very, very special to me. I've been teaching since 1989 uh, at the community college level. I'm in my 25th year at Merced College. I went to graduate school at UC Davis, and my major field was comparative politics. Uh, I'm Stephen Ruth. Uh, This is my uh, 21st year here at CSU Stanislaus. I got my PhD from UC Davis, uh, focused on American politics, particularly national institutions. I'm also serving as the Associate Dean for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences here at Stanislaus as well. My name is Andrew Conte. I am the most recent addition to the political science department. I retired from Minnesota State University, Moorhead, where I spent 34 years in the political science department, teaching international relations, international law, comparative government, and I was the architect of the international studies program. I have spent about six years here. I feel good about it. I'm proud to be part of a wonderful team of people. And I look forward to these discussions. Absolutely. And we have a lot to get into. Um, I guess the first thing I'll I'll, uh, ask is, how would we categorize this event? A lot of people might call it an attack, attempted coup, a riot. Initially in my script, I was going to reference it, just the events of January 6th. How would you three categorize or label this event? That's a great question, Frankie. I'd start off and waffle and just say, you can say for sure it's unprecedented. Um, How to characterize it comes down to, you know, your assessment of the motivations of President Trump at that time. So, but one can work off of like Mitch McConnell, the leading Republican, uh, the, the lowest level, Repu- the, the second highest Republican below President Trump. And his statements basically, you know, he basically said that President Trump provoked, provoked the attack. And so if that's true, then if you accept what, how McConnell characterized it, that's pretty damning. Because that you have a sitting president who's trying to trying to override um, the the electoral college vote via violence, and so that's why I say it's unprecedented. It's the first time in the history of this country um, that you've had you had the non non peaceful transfer of power. That that that's unprecedented. And uh, we look at President Trump's speech. You look at Senator McConnell's characterizations of it. Of the leading Republicans, leading Democrats. You can see where they're going to come from automatically. It's 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 you know, it's 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 a, it's it's a suspect day. It's a bad day in the life of this country. And so, insurrection coup. Um, I, I it's it's hard to come to, to those conclusions per se. But it's it's definitely definitely President Trump. You know, provoke provoke the attack. And so uh, you, you can draw from that what you basically will. Yeah, I'd say the last time that there was an attack on the Capitol was by the British in 1814. So we're you know, we, we don't even get assaults from other uh, countrymen, let alone let alone our own. I mean, I, I use the term insurrection. Um, 
Steve's right. I mean, an exact, precise legal definition is difficult, but I certainly think it was an attempt to disrupt the peaceful transfer of political power, and I would call it the greatest assault on American democracy since the Civil War. Well, as a newcomer to this society and an observer, I will not hesitate to call this an attempted coup. I will not hesitate to say that there is a lack of democratic temper in this country. By democratic temper, I mean when you lose, you wait for the next round. You don't take to the streets. And because democracy is not just a right of a state or one country, other democracies are looking at what you are doing. And here you have exhibited the country through Donald Trump, exhibited a total disregard for the laws and regulations of this country by going to the, on the streets. So it was certainly a surprising event, but it wasn't 100% surprising because it was alluded to during the debates. They asked Trump point blank, would you accept the results of the election? And so when it happened, I'm wondering what was your personal reaction or what were your thoughts when it was unfolding? For me, it was, I was stunned. It reminded me of September 11th. I, I, Woke up, turned on the TV, check it out. I was like, well, holy Toledo, what's going on? That That's the U.S. Capitol being being defiled. It just, to me, it really reeks very much of, of the violence and the hatred of, of of September 11th, how it really, you know, hit at the core of, of, of the American ethos of liberty and freedom and democracy. It's just, it was, it was that, that level of stunning, honestly, for me. Yeah, and for me, really, we've been talking about, I'm sure Steve and maybe Andrew as well, that maybe the greatest weakness in our country today, and I would say for the last decade, has been our internal divisions. And I think this really should have been a sobering lesson. I think that when people saw this, the lesson should have been, you know, we've gone too far with our tribalism, with our political polarization. And instead, uh, it's intensified that polarization. And, and to me, that that's the scariest thing about January 6th, because to me, I actually thought at the time, this is going to be a wake-up call. This is going to bring us together. Uh, people are going to say that we've finally gone too far, and let's go back to being rivals uh, and not enemies. And instead, the, the totalism is, is shocking to me. And uh, I think it's gotten worse, not better, since January 6th. And to me, that's, that's the greatest tragedy of all. Most of us came here because we admire how things are done in this country. A lot of us came from places where dictatorships had prevailed. And now here we are in a country that has pooped on democracy what do you think we are going to say back to our African brothers or to Europeans or for, to Latin Americans, etc.? Are they not going to say to us, hey guys, you, what's going on there? What is happening to American democracy and to democracy as a whole? It's not just about United States. It's about the world in which we live. It's about a country that many have looked to this center for democracy. It does not make me proud. It does not make me proud. So a lot of implications domestically and, and abroad. Maybe we could focus on the domestic first and then we could right. expand. You mentioned that this is unprecedented. Has there been any events in the past that came close? I would say nothing, nothing like this. I mean, you think about, you know, like 
1824. John Quincy Adams defeats Andrew Jackson, but it's it's a it goes to the House. Um, it's decided that no one candidate won a majority of the electors in the college, so it had to go to the House. Um, Henry Clay ends up, you know, convincing a number of, of, of his fellow members of Congress to, to vote in favor of, of, of Adams. Andrew Jackson's pissed off. Andrew Jackson loses it and he calls it a corrupt bargain. And so he's basically, he wins, he wins in 1828. So he lost in 1824, but there was no call to violence. There was no, there was no questioning of, 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 the, of the voting mechanism by, by which the average person voted. It was more like how the House went about, you know, work, working out its deal. Um, 1960, very close election between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Nixon could have litigated. He could have, you know, gone to the courts and tried to fight it because there was some questionable vote counting in Illinois and Texas. Um, but he didn't. He opted that, you know, it's, it's close. It go either way. You know, that's Richard Nixon, of all people, just, you know, deferring to the institutional norms, like, you know, you accept the, accept the election results and move on. And 2000, Al Gore, you know, basically, um, razor thin comes down to just a, a tiny sliver of votes. Gore, you know, they, you went through the process. You go through the process and you went to the courts and it was decided it's a Okay, it's done. We move on. And that's one thing I wanted to stress here about any political scientist will tell you the essence of, of the several. There are several pillars that make for an operational democracy. But one of the key ones is obviously elections, obviously. But a key flip side of that is that the losing side accepts that they lost the election and that they come to fight the next day. They'll be they'll be the loyal opposition. But you don't tear down the system just because you had a bad day on election day. And so there are at times, legitimate concerns about electoral fraud, you know, vote counting, intimidation of voters, you know, absolutely. But but the problem, though, is like it, it, there, the, the American system has set up a really well-institutionalized system of reconciling disputes like that. And so the system, the system worked. It, w it went to the courts, multiple, like 64, you know, courts ruled on this. You had investigations by, by state, state senates. And there's just, you know, the definitive reports indicate there's no evidence of electoral fraud in the numbers that would warrant Donald Trump winning the election. And so I understand the, the disappointment, the frustration of losing, but ultimately democratic norms are, are the heart of a democracy. That is, the, you, you, you accept the legitimacy of your political opponents and that they can actually win an election. Now, the problem here with Donald Trump is that when he won in 2016, you know, he lost, he actually lost the popular vote by several million votes. He said th those were those were fraud votes, that they were, you know, California voted three million votes just to, you know, just to make it look bad or something, you know. And so he was making those accusations six months before this election. He said, if I lose, it's, it's fraud. That, that's just destroying democratic norms. It just, I mean, I understand the frustration. I understand the, the political motivations behind it. I understand he's a political novice. He's not really tuned into the, the norms and values, what makes a democracy work. He's, he's not really, doesn't understand that, obviously. But he is such a powerful voice now, and too many Americans are simply buying that. And like, you know, I mean, if you can show evidence, bona fide evidence that there's fraud, that's got to be that's got to be examined, and talked about. But it, it was examined in depth by, by by the critical swing states, and there just isn't there. So you, you gotta you gotta move on. And the worry here, I don't mean to dominate here, but I'll wrap I'll wrap up my comments here. But the the concern here, Pradee, is looking at this is I mean the the system worked in 2020. The system held. Worry is like 2022, 2024. Will will parties accept the uh, that they lost an election because now Donald Trump has basically presented a blueprint what to follow and how to how to fight it. And just to get the word out, and that's one thing about the, the advent of social media. I mean, what would have happened in 1960 if you had social media? What would have happened in 1824 if you had social media? 1876, it might have a, a, diff, a different result, but now is now these norms are really crumbling around us. And so the correct, the big test is gonna be 2022 and 2024. How does the system hold? And and does, does it work the way, way it has been? Or is, is this a new way of going about Amer American politics and elections? We have to wait and see. But it, it is concerning because you're just not seeing leading Republicans reign in Trump. They're fearful of him to be primaried, and he's taking control of that party, and he's pushing this this, this, this fabrication about, about the election results. There's no evidence to support it. You know, if there was evidence to support it, I would say it. But you, you read the reports, you read the analyses— it's just not there. It's just not there. But the, the boggling, you know, leading Republican leaders, you know, they're just going to be they're they're 
they're they're they're they're cowing to him. And so this becomes the question: if the next major election is coming up, then how do the Republicans respond? And how do Democrats respond? Or Democrats can see the exact same blueprint. Maybe they'll be motivated to try something like this. So this is a worrisome time, and we have to wait with bated breath for 2022, which is coming very shortly, and particularly 2024. Steve's comment made me think of something that that I I hadn't come in uh, thinking about, but. I think you jogged something pretty good, and that is that a fear for me is this notion that's floating around several state legislatures and even possibly some Supreme Court justices that state legislatures can unilaterally discard electoral results. And in this particular case, if we don't like the way it turns out, we'll just unilaterally discard it. A very fringe theory. I, I heard about it years ago, but everyone basically laughed at it in both parties. And now it's it's gaining traction and you've actually had some legislation passed this way. So uh, I'm concerned. I, I think you're right. The, the norm is, is that you accept electoral defeat and then your job as the opposition is to demonstrate that you are a logical alternative to the party in power. And now it's like we're, we're not going to be the opposition party. We're going to be uh, the party in power. And, and I think the analysis that, that Steve made is right on. And uh, the implications of it are frightening for American democracy. The situation is rather scary. You may have heard that the organization for security and cooperation sending individuals to observe the 2022 election. The OAS is a regional organization that consists of 57 states and this organization is going to send to the United States a core team of 17 experts from 14 participating countries and 40 long-time observers and 400 short-time individuals. For your information and for our listeners, these individuals will be coming from Italy, Germany, the UK, Bulgaria, Spain, Greece, Georgia, Estonia, Poland, Slovakia, Germany, Serbia, Macedonia, Kyrgyz, Moldova, Bosnia, Herzegovina. And surely they have to observe closely certain things. But what Steve is saying, I want to expand upon by pointing out that since the last elections, more than 300 new voting laws have been enacted at the level of states. And those states are Texas, Georgia, Montana, Ohio, etc. And when you look at the state laws, they say to us that indeed there is a mistrust for election administrations and election officers. There is a great mistrust and that these laws that have been enacted since the last election are rather scary. These laws indeed have shown that the states can easily overturn elections in this country. At the federal level, not much has been achieved. Not much has been done. And these are moments that we should not look at lightly. 
I, I just want to build upon that and and refer also to what, what Richard talked about, you know, the legislatures, say legislatures having maybe utter command over, over election reviews. And that's why every state has a process by which disputes are resolved and it goes to the courts. And that's critical because in the courts, you have an evidentiary standard. In campaigns and politics, you can say anything you want. But in court, you can't just say anything you want. If you just say anything you want and you don't have evidence to back it up, as a lawyer, you can get into serious trouble, professional trouble. And so I think that's why I think, you know, again, I understand the worry. Democrats and Republicans worried about potential voter fraud. Laws are in place. If there's a dispute, you go to the courts. The courts work through it. You know, that that's the final umpire on, on these things because there's an evidentiary standard and judges are somewhat removed, depends on federal versus state, and are they elected or not. But, but the issue, though, is judges are removed from the political passions of the moment. Legislatures are not. And that's why the Electoral Count Act that was enacted in, in the 1880s after, after the fiasco of the 1876 election to clarify Congress's role in, in certifying votes, et cetera, is this notion that essentially that states are given a safe harbor date, that basically if there's a dispute in a state on, on, on the slate of electors being, being sent to D.C. to vote, that if there's a dispute, the state sets up a process, every state sets it up in the courts. And so by the safe harbor date, if that is done by a certain amount of time, then basically Congress does not have the authority to question those certified votes. Now, there's some bad, vague language in the Electoral Count Act, and both Republicans and Democrats, or at least Mitch McConnell's for this, is, 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 is fixing those issues, though. But the point here, though, is, is a recognition in the Electoral Count Act that the, that the dispute resolution scheme in a state has to be in place before the election takes place, because they recognize if you if election occurs and you're getting a, a result you didn't want, the legislature can, can willy-nilly change it just to get the result they want. So... There's a lot of wisdom in the Electoral Count Act as it was initially envisioned. There's some problems with the vagueness in the language that has to be cleaned up that Trump's lawyers try to focus on and, and really try to drive a truck through to motivate Pence, Mike Pence, the vice president, to not to decertify some of the state's votes. But but, but the issue that, again, back to back to democratic values and norms, it's a country, it's a rule, it's a, it's a rule of law. And so to simply capriciously throw things out because you don't like the result, that's not how the courts work. And, you know, as I said, all these these many lawsuits in these in these critical states indicated that there's no evidence to support these various contentions. And that's the disturbing thing. There's the worrisome thing about American democracy now in, in terms of social media is how how so many people can just simply follow suit. And then there's no evidence to back up what a politician's saying. We're all susceptible to that. We have a, we have a belief, motivated reasoning, et cetera, et cetera. We want to believe our party, our candidates, but ultimately... <laughs> You know, there's a point where, like, you got to have some evidence to back this stuff up. And if you don't, it's problematic. And so how do you think we got here? You mentioned social media, but there's got to be more going on. You referenced Gore and Bush, a much closer election. If these shenanigans had taken place back then, I can't help but think that the populace at large wouldn't have stood for it or bought the big lie, quote unquote. You know, there's one thing to have a politician bold enough to, to try these tactics. It's a whole other thing to have a voter base to go along with it and believe it, despite all the evidence that may be out there to go against that. So how do you think we got to the situation where we almost had a, a coup? Well, I, I work off of what Rich was saying about the polarization of the country. It's clearly there's there's this demonization of the other side. It's remarkable. You see the polling now, the polling of the last several years saying something like it's talking about how more and more people do not want to see their son or daughter be married to a member of the opposing party. That, that's a remarkable change over time. That is, that's showing that level of, of negative partisanship that is really getting more and more embedded in the American psyche. And so we're not, you know, it's cliche now, but we're not just political opponents. We're now enemies, you know, and the other side demonizes the other extraordinarily so. And those chickens are coming home to roost now with, with that type of rhetoric, with that type of campaign. But also with that, as political scientists have seen, it's, it's, what, it's what we call the, the permanent campaign. There used to be a time when there was a short period of time they campaigned, and after that they governed. They worked through the, the governance issues. But now it's just a permanent campaign. You're just trying to score electoral point after, after electoral point. So these democratic norms are really deteriorated, and, you know, and it's, it's, it's very troubling. Well, and what's troubling internationally, 
I teach comparative politics, and several years ago, in fact, when I first came to Stanislaus, it's like, hey, democracy's on the rise around the world. It's looking good. The textbook I used uh, actually used the term in the first chapter that he believed, quote, democracy was inevitable. Well, Freedom House is a site that, that I use in, in class, and democracy has declined 15 straight years in the world. And so what's going on in the United States is being seen and manifested in, in other countries in the world. And instead of us being a kind of a beacon to the world, as, as Andrew pointed out earlier, and I think rightly so, now we're just another country who's in this malaise. And it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's really troubling. The issue, it's not just about democracy. It's also about the rule of law. The rule of law. The supremacy of the law of the land. Also, it's under attack. And where you do not have a rule of law, or you have the rule of a few, and that's a recipe for disaster. Currently, this lack of a rule of law is spread around the world like wildfire. On Saturday, Sunday, there were elections held in Brazil. It was indecisive, and so there would be a second round. The current president of Brazil is referred to as the Trump of the South indicated that he was not going to step down if he's not convinced that he really lost. That's very unusual for a president. That's not what Jimmy Carter said when he was defeated by Ronald Reagan. That's not what you know, Bush said when he was defeated by Bill Clinton. And as these things are happening here, I'd like us to look at the rule of law. What is going on with the rule of law? That's one of the questions I had. Certainly, you know, you grow up thinking the laws are laws and, and they're, they're ironclad. But it seems like a lot of it was just based on good faith. No one really anticipated a president to take this action. So they, they thought it would never happen. But it happened, and it was almost unimpeded. And after the fact, it doesn't seem to be a whole lot of uh, punishment with Trump or maybe some of the major players. I know some of the individuals who were there are being tried. But again, a lot of people might say, oh, those are just the pawns. The people who are actually pulling the strings aren't being held accountable. What's to stop this from happening again? Well, I think the, the challenge there particularly is that, you know, a Democratic administration has to be very careful going after the leader of the opposing party. They don't want to turn into a banana republic and just, you know, have, have just completely politically motivated prosecutions. As we've talked about in here, it seems like, you know, there is there is compelling evidence to, that warrants, you know, a closer inspection to see whether or not a crime was committed like a potential coup or not. I mean, that's, that's serious. It, it was an insurrection or not. That's a legal question. And DOJ is, and Department of Justice is looking at that. But again, Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, Joe Biden, they have to be careful about, about perceptions about overly improper politicization of, of, of the Department of Justice. And that was a worry about Donald Trump when he asked his Attorney General to go after Hillary Clinton uh, after the election was over. Is like, you know, had already been investigated, but again, but that that public speaking out of of, of calling for prosecutions of, of leading of leading political opponents, Republicans would say that's what's going on now. And so, I mean, so you have to step back. Okay, what does the data tell you? What what's the, what are the facts? But ultimately, we have motivated reasoning. Our, our our biases, our emotions drive our reasoning as we think about things. And so, how, how do you convince someone that Merrick Garland is doing the right thing? He's not just being a, a, a prostitute for Biden for the next election. Well, and Merrick, Merrick Garland is in an unusually sensitive situation, even more than normal, 
because, of course, Trump ended up uh, nominating his uh, successor, right? They, uh, Mitch McConnell didn't allow a vote on Merrick Garland, you know, doesn't want to look like he's extracting revenge or retaliation for being denied a potential Supreme Court seat. I mean, there's a lot in the Merrick Garland situation that that goes beyond the normal politics Mm -hmm. uh, in this case. And it makes it really difficult for him uh, in terms of virtually anything he could do, given his unique situation, could make him look very politically motivated and not interested in the application of the law, which is what his job is. But outsiders are not going to take time to analyze the internal situation. Outsiders are only looking at the end results. Outsiders are less concerned about whether the Attorney General here was deprived illegally of becoming a Supreme Court judge. They are less concerned about that. They are less concerned about internal conflicts, internal infighted, etc. What the newspapers or outsiders will say, the Americans got away with it. Why can't we get away with it? The Americans did it, and they were successful. So to hell with the rule of law. That's the scary part. So then do you think January 6th has more dire implications abroad as opposed to domestically? Yes. Definitely. Yes. Because the United States is a major player. For some time, it was the only superpower left. And still, the United States is a hegemon. And so, we should look to the United States. We should look to the United States. But on the other hand, as we continue talking about the legitimacy of the current government, outsiders are a little bit worried as to what is happening to agreements that are concluded in this type of a state or with the administration. Will the United States honor agreements that are entered into during the Biden administration? And so how is that remedied? The distrust maybe of the American institutions now or or the example set, is there a way to remedy that or has the damage been done? I would say, you know, the framers' intentions were to put in place virtuous people, people who had a a communitarian orientation. There was a recognition that individualism is key. You know, individual freedom and liberties are are incredibly important. But to put people in place in power who, who are not just focused on their own personal interests, to focus on the public good, the community good. One can speak to, and I will speak to this actually, I think about Mitch McConnell, concern about norms and the rule of law. Rich referenced Merrick Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court. That was unprecedented in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court. No reason why he should not have been given a hearing and having a vote. If he had given a vote on him, he would have been confirmed. But Mitch McConnell, through, through the powers of the Senate, his powers as Senate, Senate Majority Leader, prevented that from happening. Well, one could argue that that's delegitimizing Barack Obama's presidency. You know, the way Donald Trump ran right. on, he was a birther, he, he was born He was born in Kenya, he's not, not really legitimately the president of the United States. Then he has this critical nomination. Obviously, Scalia dies. You can understand conservatives getting worried about that. You replace Scalia, you now replace a 5-4 conservative majority with a 5-4 liberal majority. So you understand it's what political scientists call a critical, critical nomination. It ratchets up the political tensions indeed. But I never envisioned that that was going to happen, just to not allow it to be a close vote, to be, to be a potential filibuster, et cetera, et cetera. But to not even give a, a hearing, that's a major, major change. And it reinforces this breakdown 
of, of these basic democratic norms at the highest level of government. And this is Mitch McConnell, the man who's at, 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 you know, who was, had a major platform to seriously critique and rebuke Donald Trump for his behavior on January 6th. Mm -hmm. This is the same man that said, you know, Barack Obama, you're just out of luck. You know, so you won two straight elections, not just the Electoral College, but also the popular vote. Your, your choice here is illegitimate. Then, then, then when, then, then basically when Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies suddenly six weeks before the election, McConnell's okay with that. That's a breakdown of the system. And, and I think the only way to fix it would be to have people in there who are properly partisan, who want to advance their partisan agenda within the rules of the game. But the game, the rules of the game are breaking down. Like there's no umpire or ref anymore. You just do whatever you need to do to win, to win that immediate fight. That, that's undemocratic that the system breaks down. How do you change that when the voters are willing to go along with the way the game's being played now? It's, that's a $64,000 question. Yeah. How do you change? That's a great question, Frankie. How do you bring about the change? I would say my initial response was like, put the right people in place. But however, as you're kind of saying, the right people won't get elected, you know? And so it's, it's, that's why we, we wait. I said, we wait with bated breath to see these next couple of elections. How is this going to play out? Is this going to get back to the equilibrium or is this going to be the, the new, the new way, the new flavor, the new, the new orientation in American politics? I, I think one of the big problems is that both political parties used to have a significant amount of moderates, moderately liberal, moderately conservative, but they kind of held the thing together. There's always been bomb throwers. There's always been extremists in, in both parties, but they were held in check by kind of moderate norms. And the problem, a whole, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, increased gerrymandering, um, the explosion of money in politics, uh, the local elites losing control of the media, and now the, the media with the internet and social media has become the wild, wild west where anything goes. I mean, all of these things have driven the parties to the extremes, and, and the people who used to hold the whole thing together are now gone. They, they, they can't win a primary in their own party anymore. And it's, uh, it, if we could move both parties somehow, and, and, and Steve's a lot more conversant in this probably than I am, uh, if you could somehow nudge the parties back towards the center, I think that's, that's the goal or the objective, but the means to do it is incredibly complicated and maybe given the changes in, in the rules, maybe can't be done anymore. I, I would respond to that. That's a great, that's a great point. But I think that so I think one of the major sources of the problem here is was like, was like a democratic resolution years ago to try to fi fix problems in the election process. And that is the advent of the primaries. You re remove the sm old smoke filled rooms where party leaders determined who the, who their nominee was going to be. You gave it over, over to the people. But the problem is you, you look at who turns out to vote in primaries. It's the more extreme ideologues who turn out on primary day because it's a non-salient election. It's not that prominent. You really need really motivated people to turn out to vote. They are particularly engaged, but they're more extreme in their views. So that works against the, mo the moderating aspects of it. And so, so what's happened then, you know, I mean, you looked at the olden days. In the olden days, 1950s conventions, no way Donald Trump gets, gets close to getting the nomination. But because you have yeah, – also, he was helped out incredibly that there were – 16 other 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 candidates he's running against that diluted the vote. If he was just him against Marco Rubio or 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 Bush, you know, I think I think that turns out differently. But you know, that spreading out the vote among, amongst the establishment Republicans definitely definitely assisted him. But I think, but again, some of the worries here is that the primary the primary system is more quote unquote democratic, allowing people voice, but it's leading to these undemocratic results. So. I think step one to reform this may be thinking about how parties conduct themselves in terms of choosing their nominees at, in the House races, Senate races, and the White House. Andrew? When you repeat lies constantly, people tend to believe them. This is the situation we are in. Too much lies. Too many lies. And people don't know now the lies from the truth. People cannot. Decide what is the truth, where are the lies, etc. It has become a lying machinery. How can we move from that? Are there any historical examples of this happening in a different country where things got out of control, 
but then maybe the ship righted itself? No. Not saying that yet. But what is happening here is that we are going to see many more military coups around. Since the Trump era, in Africa, we've seen coups in Mali, in Guinea, Burkina Faso. In fact, there was a military coup in Burkina Faso past Friday, a counter-military coup on Friday. There are many others now who may be thinking that they go back to the 60s and 70s when coups were rampant. So what are you going to say to them? If the big brother is encouraging these types of behavior, are they not okay? Are they not okay? We are pinning brothers against brothers. But finally, I want to say something again about the observers. Let's see what the observers will come up with. Their conclusions. Because the observers have to pay attention to certain rules in preparing their reports. They have to tell us whether the new voting technologies are working. Well, what was the campaign environment like? They will address the issue of campaign finance, election coverage, the laws, etc. This is unusual. They have a specific mission to perform or to carry out. I have not heard much in the media about these observers. I think for us in political science, we've got to pay attention to them. Andrew, I was unaware of this till you brought that to my attention today. And, you know, I, I told you in the office that, you know, what a contrast this is. You know, when I think about elections and contention and observers. I mean, my mental image is Jimmy Carter going exactly. in as the honest broker yes. mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and mediating a dispute somewhere. And, and to think that our system has become so dysfunctional that uh, there is a need for international observers to come in and take a look at us just demonstrates just how significantly things have changed in a very short period of time. Frankie, your question is spot on. I mean, as there's no history from what Andrew responds. There's no history of a, of a ship riding itself, getting back on track. But I think that's the thing here with, with the 2020 election and the election campaigning, the, the, the campaigns about it afterwards is like, it's just a blip or can will we get back on track? If Trump is marginalized and people then see this is a, this is a danger to the system, but you're not picking up that vibe now. And again, I think the worry is like the, the fascinating aspect from a political science perspective is to watch the evolution of the Republican Party here. How do they resolve all this? How do they reconcile it? Is his control over that party and the party leaders, you know, McConnell just, you know, holds his nose and goes along. But we got some major fears about the future of American democracy, you know, and I'm and I'm, I'm not a chicken little type. I, I rarely think the sky is falling. I, I think, oh, you know, it's a bump in the road. But maybe I'm just an old I'm just an old political scientist now. But this is really concerning to see this. I mean, this the, the rhetoric out there, the lack of of reining Trump in by other leading Republicans. I mean, Richard Nixon, you know, Barry Goldwater told him to go. You know, and that you don't have the votes to stay in office. You need to go. That was his best friend. Exactly, they were good. Exactly, that was his best friend. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think back to the last election and the fact that the Republican Party did not have a platform other than we support Donald Trump. It's scary going back to Andrew's point about the rule of law. I mean, a platform is supposed to be, here are the things that are important to us, here are the things we're gonna run on, here are the things we're gonna try to do if we're elected. And instead it was it was turned over to a cult of personality. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's frightening to me. Uh, January 6th should have said enough. I mean, 
Uh, we're, we're not going to engage and we're not going to tolerate anti-government violence. We're not going to stand for any attempt to subvert popular sovereignty. And instead, there's just this um, reckless, I think is the right word, uh, attachment to an individual. We did not address the issue of the institution of economics. The economic basis of democracy in the United States. That may be a topic for the future or for another meeting. But I strongly believe that we need to address the economic basis of American democracy. The inequalities that exist. Do these inequalities undermine further democracy in the United States. A lot of fears, a lot of questions from an attack that failed. So I think a, a question that a lot of people have, what would have happened had it been successful? That's that's a great question. Who knows? I mean, I mean, it's just... Again, I spent my entire life in this country studying politics and history. It's just boggling to think that that it would have been successful. If it had been successful, I, I would not be able to recognize my country on the basis of what, what you know its predicates are. Mm. Um, but that's one thing I say. I, I understand the Republican concern, the great Republicans' concern about elements from the left, elements of the Democratic Party about wokeness, critical race theory, um, the, the exploding deficit. Um, you understand all that. I understand. But I mean, that's getting at the richest point. I mean, parties, you know, used to run campaigns predicated on policy, policy differences. We got to get back to that. that what, what, but it, now it's that it's so much of it is identity politics in terms of, you know, class, race, gender, but also party. Now just partnership becomes identity politics. It's tribalism for tribalism's sake. And you got to get back to rational discussions about is this the right policy? I mean, it's fascinating, the, you know, the culture war aspect of it, which it seems to be overriding many, many other considerations, at least in campaign rhetoric, is this is, is this idea that, you know, that wearing masks becomes a flashpoint. You have a bona fide public health crisis, but then the worry from the right is that you've got this over overreaching governmental apparatus. You can't stop deep state stuff. I understand some of those concerns, but ultimately you're losing such basic faith in governmental and institutions. And, and polling is clear. People are losing more and more faith increasingly over institutions. But like what drives that is a function of social media that, you know, you go to YouTube and you can see someone, you know, wax, wax poetic about it. Yeah, where are people getting getting their information, you know, and, and what are they working off of to, to come to their conclusions, to come to come to their politi political beliefs? But again, I think it's just it's just it's a, it's a sorry state when the parties j j just become tribes as opposed to bona fide discussions of, of kind of alternative directions to go with public policy. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just extend that by saying that in the political world, there are typically are debates about two things. One's interests, and that's what we're talking about with public policy. And interest can be negotiable. You can negotiate money, you can negotiate a line on a map, but increasingly interests are being transferred to values. And you can't negotiate values because they're part of who you are. And when Steve's talking about identity politics, for example, or class or what, whatever it happens to be, I mean, these, these, the, these are, are being increasingly framed in terms of value discussions. And you know, we, we know that wars of values are, are much more devastating than, than wars of interest, for example. And so, you know, if our domestic politics is going to be shaped by value wars rather than a clash of interests, we're in truly, truly deep trouble. That's a really good point. If it had succeeded... But I've gone back to the days of Joseph or Stalin. That's what would have happened to the United States. With all its implications, the Joseph or Stalin era. Now you're scaring me, Andrew. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I wonder about that because you think about the American system... We have multi layers of government. You got state government, local government, county government, the feds. You got all those 
all those federal judges, lifetime appointments. I, I don't know. It just seems like, you know, our system shook dramatically on, on, on January 6th, yes. but it held. Mm -hmm. And even if it hadn't held, it seemed like this country to write itself has got, has got the mechanisms to write itself to get back on track. It potentially does. Because other countries don't. Because I think we're, we're such a densely institutionalized country in terms of the different levels of government, checks and balances, et cetera. So 100,000 governments. Yeah, exactly. Approximately. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that, that, that density, you know, if you have, end up having a dictator in Washington, D.C., uh, you've got court cases galore, you know. I mean, so. You got court cases, but then you also have public opinion. And I think what I was most shocked by is the aftermath of January 6th. I, I expected maybe some of the Trump loyalists or, or Trumpers or however you want to label them to maybe have their opinion swayed, but nobody I know was dissuaded at all. In fact, they were all for it, uh, buying into other theories that Antifa was part of the crowd or that it was just uh, an expression of their freedom of speech and a, and a right, and it wasn't an insurrection. So... Uh, as a non-political scientist myself, just an average citizen, you know, I feel like we're in a mode of we'll just wait and see if it happens again, and we'll wait and see if the in institutions hold. Well, what's interesting is when you read analysis, you read books that have interviewed Trump aides and high-level senators and House members, et cetera, you really do see early on, right, January 6th, Kevin McCarthy, other Republican leaders were like, Trump's got to go. He's got to go. But time heals all wounds. And, you know, just a few weeks, a couple months later, you know, basically McCarthy's there rehabilitating Trump. He goes goes to Mar-a-Lago. He does that pilgrimage. And if McConnell and McCarthy had shut, tried to shut him down, may have worked, may have shut him down. May, maybe not. I don't know. But it guarantees it won't work if you don't do it. They bought into it because they recognize in terms of power, you know, Trump has awoken that part of the electorate that the Republican Party had just been ignoring. And that kind of used to be somewhat in the Democratic Party side of things. But the Democratic Party now has changed dramatically. So is the Republican Party. And so they're going after very, very, very different coalitions of voters. And so, you know, McConnell recognizes Republicans to maintain control of the House and Senate and the White House. You need, you need, to, you need to, to put forth messaging that resonates with that element inside American society. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're being rational in, in one sense. But again, that's why the framers, you read the framers, they really look for virtuous leaders that just would not be focused on the immediacy, but think of longer term implications. But so much of American politics now is that immediate, the immediate win, the, the immediacy of it all is as opposed to thinking longer term benefits for the country and, and, you know, have, have, have stability there. That seems to have become a secondary consideration. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today and there's still a lot more ground to cover, especially considering that there's still trials to be held there's five members of the Oath Keepers that are being charged. People from 39 different states who have been charged with crimes, January 6th Commission. It's still a lot to get to the bottom of. And so I anticipate inviting you three back on in the near future to discuss whatever else develops or the things that we didn't get a chance to uh, cover today. We, so we, we do have the midterms coming up and we can talk about those. Those, right. are gonna be fa those are fascinating in so many ways in terms of public opinion, Biden. Trump, 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 Trump's potential impact there. Uh, we can, we've got lots to talk about. I'll put that down on my calendar midterms. We'll definitely have to do this again. So before we uh, close out any final thoughts, I just want to thank you for inviting us. I think this was a great idea. I, I hope you do this uh, with a whole lot of other people and give them an opportunity. I was honored that I was invited. So thank you very much. Same, same here for me. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Frankie. Thank you. All right. And thank you for that. This is the end of the Stan State Educast. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to be notified of future episodes, please follow and subscribe to the Stan State Educast on your favorite podcasting platform. You can also find this podcast and other podcasts at csustan.edu slash podcast.